All right, take your Bibles and your notes will will come here in just a moment. If you don't have a Bible or a copy, uh, there will be scripture printed on the notes here, so uh, don't worry about that at all. Take your Bibles and look with me in Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 10 through 20. Let's read. It says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care for of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, or humbled, if you will, and I know how to abound. I Everywhere, in all things, I am structured both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, that's the region that Philippi would be located in, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we help ask for your help. As we look at your word, I pray that you would help me to understand and communicate it the right way. Help me to communicate it truthfully. And then I pray that those who are hearing, including my own heart, as we hear your word, we would um, be convicted of your Holy Spirit and pointed out things and, and learn things that we need to hear so that we can just better glorify and obey you. And I pray that everyone here would find a way to respond to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we face a presidential election in a couple of weeks, one issue that's on many voters' minds is how does each candidate propose to handle the economy, right? There's a picture I'll show you that maybe this reflects your grocery budget. <laughs> you know, with inflation surging, right, in the past few years, interest rates increasing, the overall cost of living getting higher and higher. Basically, we want to just know, hey, what's your, talking to a candidate, what's your economic plan, right? Each candidate often has a plan, and they try to do their best to make it sound attractive and, and of course, doable and, of course, effective. Um, but occasionally, you'll hear a feisty inter interviewer or maybe a town hall question say something like, and who's going to pay for all this? <laughs> Have you heard someone say that? And that's a good question, right, with lots of plans going on. Who's going to ultimately, who's going to help out and who's going to make this get done? But I could say we could probably ask a similar question. Don't worry, we're going to shift from politics right now, okay? We're going to leave that over there. We're done. We could ask a similar question to God's plan and God's mission to reach the world. This picture next will just kind of tell you what God's mission looks like, right? You see a big crowd of people. And do you know it's God's will that all of those people be saved? God's plan is that more people will come to repentance. And we would say, God, what a glorious and grand vision you have, right? Isn't his plan wonderful to bring all things to himself, to glorify himself through all? But we would say something like, God, how do you plan to pay for all this? How do you plan to get this done? He told part of that answer to his disciples. Remember when he sent his disciples out by two? He said, don't take a purse. Don't take scripts. Don't take any money. And he said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, you know, if you have food and raiment, you should be content. So don't seek those things. Seek the kingdom of God first, and all these things shall be added unto you. So 
we see ultimately God will fund his mission. And partly he says, don't worry about that part, okay? I'll take care of it. But our passage here today is a snapshot or a case study, if you will, of God's provision for his mission. We have one man, Paul, who's busy in ministry. He's a full-time minister. He see, we see Paul being supplied and, and supported by a church that themselves was struggling. And we see that Paul's needs are met, and those who were moved to meet his needs, their faith grew as a result of that. So God's economic plan to fund his mission, to bring all things to himself, is quite simple. There's a two parts to his plan. Number one, it's gracious receivers and gospel-focused givers. Gracious receivers and gospel-focused givers. He uses us to meet needs. In many ways, the gospel is funded by God's people from the bounty of his collection. The distribution of our giving is often a a demonstration of our worship that says that what we own and what we've been given is on loan from God. It belongs to him. And we look to meet needs based on what he's given us and how he's led us. So God's mission is funded by his people. We're coming on the heels of a missions conference last week where we were able to give toward some gospel-focused endeavors. So let's look at Scripture's model for this method of grace giving today. Hey, being part of his body means being gospel-focused givers and gracious recipients. So let's look, first of all, at the givers. The givers are gospel-focused. I believe that's a blank in your notes. The givers are gospel-focused. The church at Philippi was gracious. They were gracious in their giving to Paul uh, so that the gospel could continue and it could flourish. They gave to him so that he could be helped in his endeavor. Notice the gift was going towards the furtherance of the gospel. It was going towards a gospel worker. Giving in general, would you agree, is commendable? Giving is a Christian idea. Uh, We know that is a a good thing, giving to charities, giving to hurricane relief fund or a refugee crisis. It's it's commendable. The the idea of giving is a Christian idea. But just because we give doesn't mean we're necessarily giving to gospel furtherance. And this passage here is describing intentional gospel-focused giving. So the Philippian church sent by way of Epaphroditus some money. They sent that along the way so that Paul would be blessed, literally to fund his calling from God. And Paul gives five descriptions of this gift that the Philippians gave to Paul. And the first was that it was commendable. It was commendable. Their actions were cause of rejoicing to Paul. Their gift warranted a letter and a, one of the most well-known thank you notes in scripture, right? This is literally Philippians as a thank you note. Look at verse 10. Paul says, but I rejoiced greatly now that at the last your care for me has flourished again. Paul briefly mentions that the Philippians had given in the past and their care had flourished again after a period of being unable to to give. They, They lacked opportunity. This kind of giving produced and Paul, a rejoicing. He said, I rejoice that you have given to me. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Right? Giving is a good thing. God says, you should be givers. Not grudgingly, not of necessity, not in a way that, oh, I have to give, right? I've been forced to give, or I've been manipulated to give. But do it in a way that you're cheerful because God loveth a cheerful giver. Giving that is grace-motivated and gospel-focused is commendable and honorable. God commends, and we can rejoice when we give in this way. Giving to support gospel workers and gospel initiatives is not an activity that will leave you empty, but it will leave you full and satisfied. So we could say in this context, really, emptying your pockets will fill your heart. Giving to God's mission leaves you satisfied. There are things that I've 
purchased before that I've regretted. Anyone else like that here? <laughs> I wish I would not have spent that much money on that thing or wish I would not have bought it, period, right? But there's never been a time when I've given to something that God has purposed in my heart, that God has pointed out will, will fund his mission that I've regretted. I've never regretted giving that. So this is a kind of giving that is commendable. That's why Paul's rejoicing. He's kind of in an awkward position. He's the one giving the gifts. But he's saying, I rejoice with you because you made a decision to fund God's mission. But secondly, he describes this gift as caring. It's caring. That's the second point in your notes. He said in verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your, what's the word there? Your care of me has flourished. Wherein you were also, again, there's the same word, careful or filled with care towards me. Twice in this passage, he uses and describes this gift as caring. He said, when you gave to me, you were showing that you, you cared. It was others-minded mentality. It was, it was their thinking of other people that directed their use of their wallets. Other people was in their mind. You say, where did this others-minded care come from? How were they so others-minded? Well, I would say, first of all, their humility created a caring spirit. They were following the commands of Scripture. In Philippians 2, verse 4, earlier in the same letter, Paul says, let every man not think of the things of himself, but let every man think on the things of others. Then in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter says, let every Christian be clothed with humility. Because God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When you are in a humble spirit, you are naturally more others-minded. You are more naturally concerned about what others' needs are and desires are before you are your own needs and desires. And this will always work your way out into your budget. It will always work your way out into your, your bank statement. You will see if you are others-minded or selfishly focused. But their humility didn't just create a caring spirit. Their compassion created a caring spirit. Sympathy creates concern, but compassion produces action. Are you merely concerned for others or are you moved to action? This past week, my daughter brought a book to me to read, and it was called The Little Engine That Could. You ever read that story before? In that story, there's a little engine that couldn't make it up the mountain. And it was so sad because the boys and the girls on the other side of the mountain couldn't get the toys and the, and the candy and all those things. And in the story, one train comes up, and they said, hey, could you help us? And he was unconcerned, so he drove away. He said, no, I'm not going to carry the likes of you, he said. And then another train, and you know the story. This kind of goes on and on until there was one train that looked kind of small and insignificant, but that train engine was moved with compassion because that train hooked up the train in need and carried them up the mountain, saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, right? It kind of like the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember the Levite and the priest? They were concerned, like someone should do something, but not me. But the Philippians had not just concern, they had compassion. And it proves that they had compassion because they actually gave to meet someone's need. They weren't just, oh, we're sending our well wishes with Epaphroditus. We hope you're doing well, Paul. No, they said, here's proof that we care. This is something to get you through, to support you. We love you, Paul. This is the compassion of Jesus as seen in Mark chapter 1 when he could have healed a leper from afar. Doesn't Jesus have power to do that? But what did Jesus do to that leper in Mark chapter 1? He touched him. He spent time with him. This is compassion. It's love in action. And their compassion showed their care. This is the reason why Christians should be good at baby showers, right? Christians should be good at missions giving. We should be really good when, when families in our church get sick and we move to meet their needs because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So if one part of the body hurts, the other part of it feels it. And we want to move to action to, hey, I don't have much, but what I have, I can, I can give to you. This is a compassionate move. 
but their fellowship created caring spirit. Look at verse 14. It says, notwithstanding you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. What is he saying? He says, you shared in my distress. You communicated, you came alongside me in my affliction. Their fellowship produced a caring spirit. They knew that fellowship wasn't just talking after church in the foyer about the weather. They knew that their fellowship wasn't just being in someone's home and, and enjoying each other's company, but fellowship was we are on the same team. And if you're down and out, I want to do what I can to pull you up. And sometimes that means financial support. Sometimes it means prayer. Sometimes it means counsel. Sometimes it means uh, giving someone a rise. Someone, it can mean a lot of different things. But for this situation, they said we are in a true fellowship. Which means, Paul, we don't have much, but what we do have, we took a collection for you. We want to know that we support you. So their care extended beyond the potluck and into the prison where Paul was. It wasn't just, hey, let's get together and fellowship around some food. Paul, you're in prison. We're not. And we want to give of our, the way that God has blessed us. This is their, their care. Their care was evident in their gifts. But thirdly, we see that their care was described as supportive. It was supportive. Look at verse 15. Paul says in verse 15, he says, Now you Philippians know that at the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, now if you remember the, the history, he went from Philippi to Thessalonica. So after he left Philippi, he says that he sent them two times. He sent them a gift to help that ministry and that church. This church was giving to the support of the ministry of Paul. Their giving spirit acted as support to his ministry. It, it, it held it up, right, without people like the, the Philippians. I'm sure there are other churches and individuals and, and other ways that God supplied, but in this situation, their gift supported his ability to go and start another church and to go and minister in another place where they couldn't go. They gave to Thessalonica. There was no connection between Thessalonica and Philippi. There was no way that that benefited them, right? They just loved the gospel. They just thought it's a great idea that Paul is also going to Thessalonica and that he's going to do the same thing we, that he did here and give us the same message that we got. We love that idea. Paul, won't you take some of our money so that you can do that successfully and quickly and effectively? This is the model, guys. This is the basis of, of giving money to missionaries, giving money to missions agencies, right, to, that go oh, places that will never be. Guys, there's, there's 38 missionaries that we support. And most likely, very few of us in this room will ever get to see the ministries that those missionaries get to start and flourish. It doesn't really benefit us, does it? Right? That's not why we do it. We say, if we can give a small part so that you can be there full time and invest and support and counsel and see people come to Christ and, and see the churches raised up and more churches planted through villages, take our money. <laughs> we love that idea. In some instances, we're giving directly to a missionary or an agency, but any way that we're supporting full-time gospel ministry. Church, aren't you excited about that opportunity to do that? It's supportive. I remember last week, we had a ministry come in, CORE, and they were able to identify villages and remote areas and, and establish and find national pastors that are already there. They're there. They're doing the work, and they need a little bit of financial support. Maybe last week God tugged on your heart to, to support a national pastor. Or maybe our church can come alongside that ministry and they could find a national pastor for us to support. Wouldn't that be a wonderful opportunity to support full-time gospel ministry? It's what the, Phil, the, the, the Philippine church, not the Philippine church, the church of Philippi was doing. They were supporting the ministry of the gospel. Maybe God moved your heart last week. Let me challenge you. Go back on the core website. Look at those national pastors. Pray about a way that you can support some. And we can give your money to support God's mission. But he also described this gift as sacrificial. Look at verse 18. He says, but I have all and abound. I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. And here's how he described this gift. An odor 
of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He describes this with unmistakable biblical sacrificial language, doesn't he? Paul doesn't say anything about the amount that they gave, by the way. Whether he received $5 million or $5 was outside of the realm of importance. The point was he knew that what they gave was a measure of sacrifice to them because he lived with them. He knew their financial state. It was kind of like Christ's commendation of the widow woman who gave those just a little bit amount, right? He says, everyone else, you see, they gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. And he didn't praise the ones who gave out of their abundance. He didn't praise that. He gave, he, he praised the one who gave from her poverty, which tells us the amount is not significant. It's whether God has your heart. That's significant. And he knew that this church sacrificed to give to his needs. Look at, uh, on, on the screen here, 2 Corinthians 8. You say, how do we know that this church was in poverty? Well, look what it says. Moreover, brethren, we do wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He's talking to Corinth now about churches back in Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their, you see what it says? Deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing to give them themselves. Beyond their power. What does that mean? Beyond their ability to give, they were willing to give. That's what it says. There's a map I'll show you. Because you say, where's Macedonia? You see Macedonia up there at the top? This is like modern day Greece. Do you see right underneath the inn in Macedonia? You come down, what city do you see? Philippi. You see also Thessalonica and Berea. Philippi is in these churches that he's talking about of Macedonia. That out of their deep poverty they gave. Back to the verses, it says in verse 4, praying us, or or begging us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord. He's referring to a a collection that Paul was collecting, that he was going to take all these funds from other churches and give it to the church in Jerusalem because they were suffering persecution and they were suffering hardships from a famine. And you see, why, why would they want to give to Jerusalem? They've never been to Jerusalem before. They don't know anybody, anybody in Jerusalem. Why would they give out of their poverty? And it says in verse 4, they were literally begging us to give. Why? Well, verse 5 tells us. Why did they give? Because they first already gave themselves to the Lord. Which means nothing that they had was themselves. It wasn't their own. They signed a blank check a long time ago and said, Lord, whatever we have, just tell us when you want us to give it. God, you are a giving God. You gave your life for us. So we want to be giving people. We don't have much, but we know that our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem that we'll live with in eternity one day, that we'll never meet here. They're suffering. Paul, Apollos, uh, Timothy, take our gift, we beg you. We don't have much, but take what we have. Their giving was sacrificial. Why were they givers? Because they gave themselves to the Lord already. It's interesting that Paul uses identical language in Ephesians chapter 5 to describe Christ's giving. Do you see this? Let's let's compare. Look at Ephesians 5, 2, over there on the left. It says, And walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us. How? As an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. This is a sacrifice to God. Look at how he describes the gift to the of the Philippians here. He says, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Just as Christ's sacrifice was acceptable and well-pleasing to the Lord, so was the sacrificial giving of this church at Philippi. Sacrificial 
and well-pleasing to the Lord. This is an act of worship, wasn't it? This is not just an offering. This is not just getting a tax write-off, which I'm pretty sure was not possible in Rome, right? This is much more than those things, wasn't it? It's much more than just writing a check out of your budget and sending it mindlessly. It was a representation of their surrender to Christ. They already knew, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, if you do that, tell me which part of your life is held back for yourself. Nothing, right? Even your money. Pastor Josh, I don't like it when you keep saying money. Well, holding on to anything that's ours, right? Including your money, your vehicle, your kids, your, your, your plans. It's a reflection of who you believe owns that thing. So if you hold on to it with a tight fist, we are told that we might believe that it belongs to me. But God, what would you have me to give to others or to your mission? Our giving is very much a part of your sanctification. Your giving spirit is part of your growth in Christ. Your notes read this there. It isn't the money that we give that sanctifies us. No, no, not that at all. But it's the heart that is surrendered that moves us to give. That's what sanctifies us. Listen, no one's looking at what you give and saying, well, I wonder how if they're even close to the Lord. They only gave $10. This person gave $1,000. That's not how it works. It's the heart that is surrendered to the Lord that is moved to give. That's the, sanctific- that's the sanctification. That is the growth in Christ. The Old Testament itself recognizes that our outward ritual should be the manifestation of our inward realities. If you look on the screen at Psalm 51, God says, David said to God, you desire not a sacrifice or else you would, I would give it. God delights not in burnt offerings. It's not the ritual, he's saying. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So contributing our our material resources is no less a spiritual activity than in other aspects of the Christian experience. It is an integral factor to the believer's sanctification. But lastly, their gift was blessed. Don't worry, we're not going to finish this sermon today, okay? We're going to stop after this. We're going to finish with this here, but their gift was described as blessed. Now, what do you mean by that? Look at verse 19. He said to the Philippian church, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This is probably one of the most common promises that Christians love to claim, isn't it? God will supply our needs, but I will say it is perhaps one of the most misused promises. Let's think about this in context of the promise that we can do this now, right? Who is this promise given to? Verse 18 tells us there was a sacrificial gift given, right? So in context, right, we're talking about God supplying the needs of believers who gave sacrificially to support gospel work. Correct? Everyone loves to be a verse 19 Christian, but where are the verse 18 Christians? Right? The the sacrificial Christians. That's giving a sacrificial gift that is a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. Forget that. I want to talk about verse 19. God will supply all my needs. But those verses are connected. The sacrificial giving is the prerequisite to the promise of God's unconditional provision for your life. The truth of the matter is, God does not promise to indiscriminately give toward the needs of people who are unwise with their money or tight-fisted in their giving. Quite the opposite. In fact, 1 John 3, 17 tells us that if a brother comes to another brother and says, I have need, and they don't give, he says, how can that person say that they are a Christian? So this sacrificial, willing spirit to say, God owns everything that I have, so I'm willing to give 
as he leads is a prerequisite. A man called into a financial show that popped up on my feed this week, and he said that he had a yearly income of $400,000. I thought, wow, this guy must be doing well. And he said, but I cannot find any way to build my savings. I have nothing in savings, he said. So, of course, the host dug a little deeper and found out the reason that this person couldn't save any money, and you're probably thinking, I could save some money if I had that amount, right? The reason was something called lifestyle creep. You know what that means? The more money you get, even if it's just like 100 bucks extra, right? We spend more, don't we? Which means that we're naturally uncomfortable with less. Which means our, I'm going to put this in quotes, our needs go up. So my question is, what do we insist that we have? What are needs? And do they line up with what God says we need? Is it the number of vacations we have? Is it a number of nice meals that we can enjoy? Is it a certain quality of a car or expensive hobby? And my question, and I would say God's question in verse 18 is, where is the sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice? You know, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, that was the name given to the man, Abraham, who sacrificed his son. That's when his name came up. What did Abraham give? Everything. He gave his son. God provided, again, a sacrificial gift. Here's a truth bomb. That God's provision... His provisional blessing is abundant in the face of our total surrender, but it is unpromised in the abundance of our tight grip. There is material remuneration for spiritual sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 9 says, This I say, he that sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So every man, as he purposes in his heart, Let him give, not grudgingly, not of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'll never force anyone in here to give to our church or to gospel funding missions, but where is God moving you to give? In the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, there's been a lot of stories that have been popping up that have been encouraging, right? In the face of tragedy, there have been people that have moved to give. Back at 9-11, when that happened, Mr. Rogers was famous for telling a a group of kids that he was trying to explain what happened. He said, kids, when bad things happen, always look for the helpers. What does that mean? It means in tragedy, there's always people that are helping. They always spring up. And a lot of times, those helpers are followers of Jesus who also are in need of help themselves. There's no exception to the Hurricane Helene incident. There's stories like a son journeying 11 miles into the Blue Ridge Mountains to find his parents. And another story I read about a pastor and a a small group of church members that navigated a collapsed road to deliver aid to stranded residents. Cameron Bryson was the pastor of this small church in North Carolina, and he received a call on a Sunday evening that there was a small town about 1,400 miles, or I'm sorry, 1,400 feet in the Blue Ridge Mountains that was completely cut off by floodwaters and cracked roads. So the next morning, he assembled some churchgoers in a church truck, or someone's truck from the church, and they loaded it up with the members and food and water and other supplies and headed up to Marion. After some maneuvering on down trees and snapped power lines, the group eventually came to an impassable road and had to continue the climb on foot. A small group of first approached the first house, and as they approached the house, they heard a baby crying. And a mother came out and said that the night before, they had just ran out of formula to feed her baby. And the pastor said, we just happened to have exactly what they needed. So they gave it to the mother. Christian, I will tell you this. As a giver... God has given you just exactly what someone else may need. You may have something materially that God has given to you, 
that he will move your heart to give to someone else because it's exactly what they need. You have been given resources and you're, that are on loan from God to be exactly what another person needs. Would you be willing to be a giver? It's commendable. It is an act of compassion. It's something that could be a support. It, it should be sacrificial and it is blessed because God will supply your needs as you give this way. This is the reality of God's grace economy. What's your part? Let's pray. Lord, as, as we consider where we would be without your giving, we, we know that we are completely hopeless. So please help us now to understand what we've been given. And Lord, if there's a part of our heart that is holding on to something, may we surrender it now. It's not about the amount that we give. Lord, you would, you would never guilt us into giving something. But you really just ask for our heart, which is reflected in our giving. So would you move someone today to surrender another part of their heart to you? We thank you for your provision. Help us to be content with what we have. In Jesus' name, amen.